Thanks, Gary. Good afternoon, everyone. The campaign for the Glasgow East by-election will step up a gear today. And as you've been hearing, all four main parties will shortly take part in their first live televised debate. Meanwhile, the first poll of voters in the constituency indicates Labour are ahead. Labour currently holds the seat with 13,500 majority. Katrina Renton reports. The hard graft continues for the four main parties, and for some, the gloves are off. The issues of the day... The SNP are asking why the Prime Minister and Chancellor have not visited the constituency yet. The Liberal Democrats are attacking the SNP, saying they're a single-issue party obsessed with breaking up Britain. Labour's theme, how they'll deal with crime and antisocial behaviour. And the Conservatives are continuing to concentrate on the rising cost of living. The first poll of voters in the constituency was published this morning. It indicates Labour are on 47%, the SNP on 33%, the Liberal Democrats on 9%, with the Conservatives on 7%. 516 local people were interviewed. There are still 11 days to go in this short campaign and the parties will do all they can to get ahead in the one poll that really counts on the 24th of July. A 22-year-old man's been stabbed at the Tea in the Park Music Festival in Perth and Kinross. He's being treated for multiple wounds at Ninewells Hospital in Dundee. He's said to be in a serious but stable condition. It happened just before a quarter to one this morning in the festival campsite's yellow zone. Tayside police are seeking two men who they say are likely to have blood-stained clothing. Officers have spent the night at the festival interviewing witnesses and other campers. Police are asking the public for more information about the murder of a man with links to Scotland's criminal underworld. The body of Martin Toner was discovered in a field near Lang Bank by a farmer exactly four years ago today. He'd suffered extensive injuries. Mr Toner was due in court on drug trafficking charges shortly before his death. Police believe that because of his criminal connections, people with information may be reluctant to come forward. Six high flats have been demolished in controlled explosions in Glasgow and Paisley overnight. At about half past two, four Glasgow Housing Association were brought down in the Site Hill area of Glasgow. At half past five, the Milliston Council flats in Paisley were destroyed. Now here's the weather forecast. Much of the country will have a dry and bright day with some sunshine. The best bits across the east of Scotland from Murray and Aberdeenshire down to Fife and the Borders. It's going to be warmer in the east than over the past few days with temperatures rising to 19 Celsius. That's 66 Fahrenheit. It will stay dry but it'll become rather cloudy this afternoon with even some patchy rain. Less cold tonight, lowest temperature 9 Celsius. Now you can get more details on the Glasgow East by-election on the website bbc.co.uk forward slash Scotland News. Now back to Gary. Thank you, Rob. In fact, you can hear more about it right now. Just 11 days to go until the people of Glasgow East are given the chance to have their say in what is being seen as a crucial by-election for the Prime Minister. Can Gordon Brown's Labour Party hold on to its majority? Or can the SNP in second place last time pull off the political earthquake that Alex Salmond has been predicting? Well, you've just seen that opinion poll this morning showing Labour ahead but with a sizeable swing towards the SNP. This ICM survey for the Sunday Telegraph puts Labour on 47% and the Nationalists on 33%. The poll shows the Lib Dems are on 9% and the Conservatives on 7%. Well, let's hear what the candidates for the four main parties in this by-election make of that and the other big issues in this campaign. They are here now. Margaret Curran is here for Labour, John Mason for the SNP, Ian Robertson for the Liberal Democrats and Davina Rankin for the Tories. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us. Uh, first of all, Margaret Curran, just on the story that Glenn Campbell was bringing us there just a few minutes ago, has Mike Daly, a Labour activist, jumped the gun on this one in accusing the, the, the government of uh, perhaps sleight of hand and, and maybe more? Uh, because he says that the withdrawal of this uh, award was politically motivated. Well, I mean, I obviously don't know all the substance behind this, but it is deeply concerning. As a former minister myself, I'm very well aware of the procedures you use for signing off grants and making sure grants go to organisations. And I have to say, I find it inexplicable that this kind of scale of error could be, could be made. When I made decisions in the past, you were given a paper, you signed it off, and organisations were appropriately informed. So I don't really understand what's happened. It seems to me as if certainly the government, the SNP government, moved very swiftly to deal with this. But I think I can understand why they did this. I'm glad Mike Daly and his project are getting the money, irrespective of his politics. They are a very strong organisation locally and deserve that, that resource. But it seems to me a very odd way of certainly conducting SNP business. Inefficient at the very least, could John, you say it? John Mason, politically motivated or just incompetence? I think there's a mountain being made out of a molehill here. I mean, it sounds like the government's answered the point that uh, it was a, 
it's just sent out these letters slightly too quickly and uh, perhaps that shows uh, more efficiency than inefficiency. Well, the letter said that no decision had been made and now they're saying actually a decision had been made and look, it's, it's actually gone in his favour. Well, perhaps we've got a government that can make quick decisions. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Well, it seems to have gone back on one of its decisions. It does look as though something's gone wrong here. They should at least Admit be looking it. at this. Don't I think it's been be. an administrative slip and uh, if Margaret wants to discuss slips for the next half hour, we can discuss a lot of that. OK, well, let's talk about the opinion poll that we mentioned there in the introduction showing a swing to the SNP from Labour. It's showing, unfortunately, from your point of view, Ian Robertson, that you're just flatlining, aren't you, in the polls? You're going nowhere. Well, polls can show anything, and, and there's been two polls already that pretty much contradict each other. So we're not listening to the opinion polls that are out this morning. We don't think that's really the issue. Your own report has said that the only poll that counts is the poll on the 24th of July. We're running a very positive campaign. What we're hearing on the doorstep is that people are moving towards the Democrats as a, a real alternative. They're just not saying it to the pollsters. Well, many voters don't say what they believe uh, entirely in polls, and many voters make up their mind running up to the, to the time of the ballot. And we think that people are thinking very seriously at the moment about where they're going to go, and we know that that's not Labour. And they're considering this single-issue party, the Scottish National Party, and this single-issue candidate that we've got here this afternoon. And what they're realising is that it's a very serious decision they have to make. They want a good local MP. They want somebody who's going to make a difference in the community. And that simply isn't being offered by the SNP or the Labour Party. So well, we're very confident. Given a rank of 7% for uh, the Conservatives, it seems as though David Cameron's visit to the constituency went down like a lead balloon as far as the voters are concerned. I would disagree with that. We've been out working hard on the streets of Glasgow East and we're getting a very positive reception. We are meeting people time after time who are more interested in talking about the issues that they're concerned about, the increased cost of living, the, the, the fear of crime, and we're working hard and we're having a fantastic reception. We're putting forward positive solutions so people have an option. We're not talking about continued labour failure. We're not talking about constitutional risk with the SNP. We're saying if you want someone that will work hard for you, stand up and fight for you, folk Conservative, and we're getting a fantastic reception. Your best hope, though, is to hold on to your deposit, really, isn't it? best what we can have is to get every vote possible. We'll be taking vote from Labour, votes from the SNP, votes from Lib Dems. We will take every vote possible and we're campaigning hard. But is your strategy really just to hold on to that deposit? Our strategy is to work hard, get out and about amongst the people of Glasgow East, speak to as many people as possible in what is a very short time within the by-election, but we are working hard to get every vote possible. Uh, Margaret Curran, you've lost 14% support in a week of this campaign. If this continues, then we could potentially see this earthquake that Alex Salmon's talking about. I honestly don't think so. I mean, I would take nothing for granted. I never have in elections and I never will. I'll be out there working for every single vote. I mean, I actually do think that, you know, this is progress, but there's a lot... Progress? This, losing 14% of the no, vote? This is, no, this is... In terms, well, in terms, Gary, where people were predicting we would be and, you know, and Mr Salmond, who seems to speak an awful lot on behalf of Mr Mason. Maybe we'll hear what Councillor Mason has to say for himself later on. Well? Yeah, well, good. Um, but I do think we're making progress. We're getting a good response. I have made no secret of the fact I think the Labour Party has work to do. We've got to work hard to win the confidence of voters and I, as a strong local candidate I think I know the area very well, I'm determined to do that. The Labour Party has got to work hard to win this election, I make no dispute about that but we're going in the right direction and overall I'm confident we can do it. Well, some sources are saying in the newspapers today, Labour sources, saying that actually the result could be even closer than the opinion polls are suggesting. Is that your feeling? Well, let me do something shocking and agree with the Liberal Democrats for a change. The only poll that matters is the one on the 24th of July. I'm out there to win the confidence and trust of the good people of the East End of Glasgow. I honestly believe Labour's got the programme to do that and I've got the record to do that and I will go down to Westminster as a champion of the East End of Glasgow. I will work very hard, but I'm out in the doorsteps winning that campaign. I'm making no assumptions. You should never take voters for granted, ever in an election. Well, let me just go to John Mason for a second here. Your party's up 16% in this, but that's not an earthquake. It's a sizable chunk of the opinion polls to be believed, but at the same time, it's nowhere near the 22% you need. So Mr Salmon's predictions are falling slightly fl uh, wide of the mark at this stage. Well, 15% is two-thirds of the way to 22%, so that seems to me like pretty good progress so far. And uh, another 7% is achievable. So we're out there working. Our activists are uh, more up for it than any other party. We had more activists out yesterday than any the other parties combined. So we are up for this. We're going to give it our best shot. And uh, it's up to the people of the East End to decide how to vote. I completely agree with that. But uh, it's a two-horse race. 
and we're up for it. Well, Gary, Gary, it's clearly not a two horse race. I think the people at home at the moment. I think the opinion poll is suggesting it is. Well, it? I think the people are suggesting that it's not mm. on the doorstep. I mean, this is the first opportunity we've had to speak to the people of Scotland directly. And I don't think they want to hear us discussing opinion polls, in which are very small sample sizes, which really don't make a difference to people in Eastern and Glasgow. I think we should be talking about the issues that matter That's to people in the homes. Okay. And I think the sooner we get on to that, the better. I think, in, in terms of our campaign, we want to talk to people about what matters to them. OK, well, let's talk about issues then. Indeed. Local income tax, one of Indeed. your policies. The uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland today mm -hmm. saying that this is unworkable. No, I think you find what they said is that they could work with the, the Scottish and Westminster Missions to make this work, but there are some difficulties that have to be addressed. At the moment, now, we don't see it as on, workable. On the income tax, what we are saying quite simply, and I think there's agreement in many of the parties in Scotland, that the council tax system is deeply unfair, that it's punishing many people, particularly in the east end of Glasgow. We've said already that you know at least 80% of people would be better off under the proposals we put forward. Now, on making it work, and making a local income tax work, the difference between me and my opponent to my uh, right-hand side is that we will make those things work by discussing it with yeah. Westminster as a Westminster MP. What we're not saying is that we're not willing to solve these problems, like the SNP are saying, and we're not ultimately ignoring the plight of many, many people who are currently paying this unfair tax. But we have this body today saying that this will cause cross-border tension. They're also saying there are always a, a burden on employers. There are always mm -hmm. cross-border tensions. There are always things that have to be worked out between the Scottish administration in, in Holyrood and the Westminster government. And that's why we should have a local MP who can deal with that and can discuss the issues sensibly without taking a I don't recognise Westminster government position on it. We can solve all these problems to help people in the East End of Glasgow, we shouldn't simply say it can't work, we won't do it. Yeah, Jeremy, do, you say, do you accept that well, there will be cross-border tension as well, is being can suggested? Can I just, say, can I just say first of all that I'm a member of that body, I am a chartered accountant. So you agree then at the moment no. it's not workable? No, no, that, is, that, TV, that, yes, that is yes. one of the opinions within the Institute of Chartered Accountants. There well, are it's, clearly, it's David Wood, the executive director, who's fine, saying this. But there are the clearly top. other accountants, including myself, who believe that local income tax is workable. But the main thing is to scrap the council tax. Yes. Now, 72% on the Glasgow City Council opinion poll eh, would benefit from council tax, and in another poll it's 88%. And how can Margaret Curran and the Labour Party oppose something which would help the people of the East End so much? No, we'll get to her in just a second, but no. do you accept the, the premise here that there will be tensions if this goes ahead between London and Edinburgh? Well, I, I don't believe in any way, because the eh, the... the SNP government in, in Holyrood has shown more about working with other bodies than the government did oh, government in the previous <laughs> years. And for, eight, for uh, eight years we've had Labour and the Lib Dems, a, and a, an awful relationship with local government. And over the last year, we have had a tremendous improvement with the Concordat with local <coughs> government. Hang on, hang on, hang on. prepared to work with the government. Hang on, and Labour Council is saying, God bless the government. No, <laughs> hang on a wee second. I mean, let's have a sense of perspective here. I think it's well known that the local income tax has been criticised by a number of authorities, a number of financial authorities, who say it will not work. It will hit working families hard and it will not raise the revenue that you need it to raise. In your own council, Glasgow City Council, where you sit as a councillor, there has been re recent evidence that it would really hit services hard and the SNP have never admitted the impact it would have on local services who are vital and which are vital to the people of the east end of Glasgow. But you admit people well, want that, to change. That's not nice. well, the there, But there is no doubt I think the council tax system needs to be reformed, there is no doubt about that but I think as we have seen time and time again from the SNP they try and get a cheap party slogan that they think will work without thinking through the real impact it will have on the lives of people and I think people in the east end of Glasgow and there are prosperous people in the east end of Glasgow with a local income tax would hit them hard, you know, where there's a number of taxpayers in but the But your family. policy, just to be but clear, to, is to keep but just let me finish the point. They let me finish the point. Let me finish the point. It would really impact on quality, important services for local people. And I think this is just too superficial a response that we always get from the SNP, again, about the real changes that are required. So you want to the, keep the deeply unpopular council tax? Well, I think you need to, ha I think you need to reform the council tax. How? But, I, but I do think you Tell need, us how. But I do think you need Tell to us have, how. I do think you need to have a property tax. There is no doubt about it. You need to have property tax. You can't and also, under the SNP, very many wealthy people would not pay that. Now, as a point of principle, as a point of principle, hang on a second, hang on a second. As a point of principle in East End of Glasgow, I just don't think it's in our ethics to actually think very wealthy people should escape paying tax that pay for services that matter to the most in need. Margaret, my, my problem, I mean, very, very briefly, point. my problem, Karen, is that we've had a Labour administration, we've had Labour-run councils in Glasgow City for a very long time, and only now do we hear from you that we should do something about it. No, that's this not fair. That's see policy that has been to the detriment of the people of the East. Well, to be fair, we've had a Labour Lib Dem administration. Yeah. Well, well, exactly. that's let, me, let me bring yeah, in a ranking on this one, the, on, on, on this issue of the pension tax. If you've been out there, are people telling you it's deeply unpopular? They want rid of it? No, they're not. What people are talking about are the cost of living. Mm -hmm. What they're finding is they're going into the local shops, bread is jumping up week by week. 
you know, cost of their basic stable food is jumping up. They're not interested, to be fair, in a Labour, SNP, petty fighting, because that's all we're having on the doorsteps at the moment. It's bickering between the two main parties. They're saying, I'm not happy. They're fighting amongst themselves. They're not listening to what I have to say. We want someone that will stand, listen to us, and then go and act as our voice. And what we're seeing is, yes, the council tax does have to be reformed, but what we need to tackle here and now is the cost of living. We have to tackle the cost, the rising cost of fuel, which is why George Osborne has brought forward a suggestion for the fuel price regulator. Well, I want to get to all of that in just a moment. Yes, but can what, can what, what, just a second, but I just want to ask quite specifically, what, would you, what reform would you, would you advocate? I'd advocate for a review to see what we can do to make sure that those that are that's being not hardest... Reform, though, that's just wait and see. It. More wait and see from the Conservatives. As opposed to introducing policies that don't work, have been shown by experts in the field not to work, to show nonsense. that, nonsense. for example, if you look at the SNP so-called local income tax that will be set at a national level mm -hmm. with it's a huge funding tax. black hole. Absolutely. And you look at the Lib Dems, who have been in power for the past eight out of nine years, they have failed to act. The time was the okay. Now, I, just, I want to move on. I want to move on to another issue here, which has come up. Well, but I want to move on to to another issue, which is in the newspapers today, and this is about the uh, the, the Catholic Church's view of the uh, human embryo uh, fertilisation and embryology bill, which of course was due to be discussed yesterday, uh, tomorrow, sorry, in uh, Parliament, and now that's been put off. Bishop, Bishop Joseph Devine says Labour has violated moral law, and Margaret Curran says that they're losing ethical credibility on this issue. Well, I would be, that's a very um, significant statement for Bishop Devine to say, and I don't think that would necessarily be shared um, across the communities of the East End of Glasgow. I mean, I do think faith communities uh, do very significant work and reach many important people, and I would always want to listen to leadership and people who participate in faith communities. And I do think morals and ethics are a very important part of our, all our discussions and what we do. So if you're, think, if you're the MP can, then for Glasgow East, how do you vote? Well, I'll come back to that in one second, but I do think what we need to do in the broader issue of morals and ethics and politics it's look at the, you know, the broad vista of issues that are important. You know, in terms of the work we've done in international development, in terms of the work we've done in poverty, both at home and abroad, so I do so think that's part of Bishop it. Bishop Joseph Devine is wrong when he says you're losing ethical credibility. Well, I, obviously I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, I would listen to anybody who's got any criticisms to make, and I absolutely, fundamentally respect them. So how would but you I vote? I will come on to that. But Tell I us don't. now. Excuse no, me. No, I don't think it's fair well, to well, ask. Well, 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 let's get an answer to that. Let's get an answer no, to that. I'm How would happy. you vote? I have uh, followed the debate, and I think, broadly speaking, I would vote with the government. That would be my position on that, on okay. the ideology bill. Show me some right, well, in the first place, these issues should not be whipped. Oh, well, hang on. If, you, if we're going to get a straight answer yes. to how you would vote, let's start with that. How would you vote? Right, well, I'm coming from a faith community background, uh, and I'm extremely unhappy about uh, anything, experiments with babies or research or anything like that. So my starting position is that uh, I assume we should not be doing that kind of research if there's any possible other way of doing it, and I believe there are other, are other possible ways of doing it. But so even if it's going to come up with cures for, for many uh, diseases? I think there may be from. many ways of dealing with that, and uh, I will, there'll be two months at least uh, after I'm elected before I would have to be actually voting on these, and clearly I would vote on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. But my starting position is that I'm extremely uncomfortable about researching uh, on embryos, as the government's proposing, and we, we in the SNP have a completely free vote on that because that's a matter of conscience, Indeed. and the Labour Party should not be whipping on that. Would, would you vote to... Uh, lower the, the time for abortions as yes. well? OK. What about you, Ian? I agree completely with John. I think this is a matter of conscience. I think that he's right to say that this is something that should be whipped. I think if you're going to push MPs on their, their matters of conscience decisions and not to avoid the question, then I rest with Margaret on this. I think I would have to vote with the government. I think there's some very important research that can be gained from this sort of technology. I understand that there are very passionate arguments on both sides, yeah. Yeah, but in an honest position, I, I would have to yeah. say that that would be my vote of conscience. And what about Margaret Curran lowering the... The, the, the time that people can have abortions, the time limit on having abortions? Well, as things stand at the moment, I'm not persuaded there's any need to change the current law, and that's where I would stand. But I would also agree very strongly with what Ian said. There are very strong views on both sides mm -hmm. of this argument. I think we are obliged and should hear those arguments. I have great respect and have worked very closely with many people in faith communities and would want to hear those arguments. Do they should Rankin, be respected. We're hearing that you know, there's a huge uh, number of Catholics in the constituency where you're standing, so mm -hmm. how would you vote? Um, at the moment, medical evidence is not advanced. I don't think there's a clear argument why the limit should be reduced. I think what we need to have is a sensible, balanced debate. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's too many people in this debate using emotive terms, as John Mason did earlier on. So we have to step back from the emotive language some people are using having a clear debate. And I think there's opportunity for the research to make a real impact in everyday lives if it's given the opportunity to go ahead. So you're, you're voting yes on the issue of embryo research, yes. these, these hybrid embryos, and, and no on the, on the issue of lowering the, the term time for abortion? But as the Lord Dempsey said, this is a, a conscious decision, and yes, I would. 
as you outlined, vote in that way. OK, well, just on another issue then, uh, Margaret Curran, you said this week that you weren't persuaded on the issue of uh, vehicle excise duty. What about you, uh, uh, Davina Rankin? We're told that ultimately something needs to be done about climate change. So is this not one measure that perhaps would deal with that? It's not. It's unfair. The retrospective application of the policy is unfair because families buy the best car that they can at the time. And five, six years ago, people would have thought this is a good car for us now and now they're going to be taxed. So they're in a position that they can't afford to sell it because nobody will be actually able to buy it because they increase tax and they can't afford to buy a new car. It's penalising those who are trapped in that that situation. And would that you back higher taxes for new cars then in that New case? cars going forward, yes, but not res retrospective application of the policy because that affects the families that are in fixed incomes the most and there are many of those in Glasgow East. There is an argument, John Mason, that says if you can afford to drive a big car then you can afford to pay a little more. Yes, but I completely agree with Davina about this retrospective point. It's just totally unfair that people, and I met a pensioner yesterday in Toll Cross who said this to me, that he had saved up and bought a nice car and that was really special for him and now he's just being hit with this retrospective tax. So there's something deeply unfair about that, and especially on top of the high fuel prices, where the, the Chancellor is raking in six billion extra pounds. This is all about making money, this is not about the environment. Well, what would you do to encourage people then out of their cars if this is not the answer? Well, I mean, absolutely, uh, transport is one of our key policies, and we've got the Glasgow Airport Rail Link, which is being financed uh, by the Scottish Government. We've got the M74 completion, which will improve the, the environment. The first, uh, and the, 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 and the, concession, the concessionary fares on the buses is being expanded. Not only you're, will going to all, protect, you're not going to cut it. We are not going to. We are not going to cut it. Well, all, it all everywhere. Can you Brilliant. stop her interrupting? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do apologise. He interrupted me as well. <laughs> all, all of the present people who get it will continue to get it, and in addition, the war veterans are going to be added in. So there'll be an expansion of the scheme, not a reduction. Mm. The Lib Dems always tell us that they're very green. Indeed, we've got to be very clear on this issue. Uh, this issue. I agree with what Davina said. We've been saying it this week that retrospective taxes are unfair, but we do have to encourage people into smaller cars. What we would do as a party, and we've said this for some time, is we'd abolish vehicle exercise duty. That would mean that most people would be better off. We have to look at smarter ways of taxing. This comes back to the whole issue of the council tax and the way in which we're not targeting taxes properly. We're punishing poorer people. We're not giving them value for money in transport. So we abolish that duty. We look at other ways to introduce funding for transport and give people a fairer deal for the money they're paying. But ultimately, we do need to get people out of their car, out, out of their cars, don't they? Where possible, we have to realise that you know some people well, need where cars. Where possible, so if people aren't bothered, then well, no, no, it I think really it's matter. about. I think it's about what Davina said. It's about moving from bigger cars to smaller cars. I think it's about moving from two cars to one car. We're not dictating to people they shouldn't have cars. We realise that families need cars. I use a car, and you probably use a car too, Gary. But we have to be sensible about our transport policy, and we have to be sensible about limiting the, the amount of pollution. So we want to do this gradually, with a clear and honest way that people can understand what they're going to pay, and as you've pointed out, if they can afford it, they'll pay it, and if they can't they'll make that decision consciously. Margaret Curran, you've made a big play of the fact that you will speak to the Chancellor Indeed. if you're elected. Yes, I will. So what are you going to say to him? Well, one of the key points I wanted to make in that is it's very important you ju don't just do things in a by-election as part of a campaign, but as part of a sustained style, if you like, and how you continue to represent people and do politics. So you, so so you stick to the, the policies that you've previously advocated? Yes, then, surely, absolutely. In that case. Yes. No, but I'm talking um, about the Chancellor here. No, but what I would want the because Chancellor... Because there's talk but, of him going back one, on of the, one of the key points of my campaign, Gary, has been that in the past, when we've gone through economically turbulent times, the east end of Glasgow has paid far too harsh and disproportionate price under the governments of other people. Um, but this time when we're living in economic turbulence, I think it's vitally important we protect the East End of Glasgow. And that's one of the key things I would want to do. So what I want to do is to get Alistair Darling to meet with people, not in a campaign stunt, not with media watching, but so people can, you know, taxi drivers. I met a, a woman the other day in Parkhead, I think, who was telling me about, the, the, you know, how she's suffering with her family. I think we really need to understand the experience. So the Chancellor doesn't realize. understand at the moment. Exactly. No, but no, exactly. that's, no, that's, no, that's not, no, Gary, Why have Gary, you picked that's up the not phone? Fair. Have you spoken Gary, to him yet? Gary, that's not fair. What I'm saying is when I think you're in a certain area hearing directly the, the, you know, the immediate experience of people, I think that's very important that you actually do react well, to that. Well, I just want to get an answer to this. Firstly, have you spoken to the Chancellor? And secondly, should he reduce this vehicle excise duty? Well, I think he, pr he should reduce the vehicle excise duty, and I haven't spoken to him, but I will speak to him. Why, why and I will you, speak to Margaret, I will speak Margaret, to him in Margaret, a sustained basis, simply, not just during a campaign. Why haven't you invited the Chancellor, which you're very good friends with, before this by-election campaign? You've been an MSP oh, for well, I'm happy for him to come to Why us. is it suddenly now that the Chancellor, who we presume and Alistair Darling don't understand the issues because you have to no, explain them to no, him, no, I think that's, that's ridiculous, fair. but why are you saying you'll invite him down now when you've had all the opportunities as an oh, elected I, member I, I, to do that through previously? Probably the Edinburgh. It's a by-election yeah. promise and I think we should treat it as such. No, I don't. Well, I, do, I think Alistair Darling is very welcome to come to the constituency at any other point, but my 
point was is that at this particular period, there's been a shift in economic circumstances. I mean, I meet Alistair Darling many times, and he's very welcome in the constituency. But I think what we've got to appreciate is the immediate shift there has been. There has been a downturn in recent weeks, particularly, okay. and I think it's vital he does that. So I don't think it's fair to be attacked on that but, basis. But surely we, I don't think surely that's we should both, Gordon, no, I don't think that's Surely fair. we should have both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor coming here to I listen. I can campaign on my own. I'm proud of my own okay. record. Okay. I don't right. need well, Alex Hamilton. Okay. Well, we'll leave that one in. Just a brief point. A brief point is that um, Margaret harks back. When I'm on the doorsteps meeting people, they're actually saying, well, do you know, we welcome the by-election because it's the first time in years that somebody's actually knocked on our door and asked what matters to us. Mm -hmm. And Labour's been in control yes. for the best part of 60 yes. years in Glasgow. Correct. And Margaret was part of the Labour Lib Dem yep. administration in Edinburgh for eight years of the night past nine years. Absolutely. So to suddenly say, oh, previous governments, or oh, what happened in the distant past... The Tories are still remembered, un Davina. People still remember un the Tories. unrepresentative mm -hmm. of what's been said on the street. What they're saying is, I go into the shop, it costs me more. I go to the petrol station, it costs me more. We are bringing forward positive solutions. We've already talked about the price, the fuel price regulator, which could take five pence off a litre of petrol if introduced today. Alistair Darling should have been up in the past. He should come up now. Why yeah. wait until after um, the by-election? No, what, what, what about a, win, a windfall make, tax, for instance? Can I make one would you point, support something like that? Gary, can I make one point? Which well, is, let me just, that's, no, that's I, the question. A, a would you support a, a windfall tax? A few people contradicted me in this and have raised points directly to me. It's only fair I get to answer them. One of the big things about the east end of Glasgow is it's been entirely misrepresented. There is great progress in the east end of Glasgow and there is significant prosperity. Yes, there are challenges and the challenge of poverty is one that is the centre of my political life. But let us not misrepresent the east end of Glasgow and recognise the progress has been. Is that a Let's get back to the issue. Let's get back to the issue, the issue which is the question I've just asked you here about a windfall tax. We have changed economic circumstances. Is it time to think about taxing a different way, maybe back to the way that Labour did when it first came to power and actually asking companies and, and utilities and others to, to pay more? Yes, well, I would never rule that out if I thought that was the right thing to do in the economic circumstances. But what is vitally important is you look at those circumstances in the round. And what I do fundamentally disagree with is the premise in the SNP that somehow if the money goes to the Treasury, it is therefore not spent in Scotland. Treasury, so Scotland should get a slice of any Treasury, tax, Well, well Treasury resources are vitally important, particularly in the east end of Glasgow, where through the benefit system it's very important. So I wouldn't agree with that premise. And we do know that when you raise uh, revenue in one uh, uh, tax strand, that creates pressures on others. So I just think we need to get away from some of the superficial crude debates that we have about tax and windfalls and actually begin to make, make sure that we have the levers that create regeneration and prosperity and jobs in the east end of Glasgow. They're cutting apprenticeships throughout Scotland that has a major impact. Well, they need to talk about that a bit. You were nodding the, the idea of a windfall tax, we're, Jeremy. Yes, so we're hearing a lot of... Who, who, who would we tax? Well, we're, for starters, we're hearing a lot of general words from Margaret Curran and from Labour, but nothing very specific. Well, let's have some, some now, specific The specific thing is that, uh, I think, the total stole our uh, policy about the, the fuel the tax first time you uh, reg policies. regulator. But I mean, some of the things that the Labour government are doing and have been doing, like the 10p tax rate going up to 20p, that hurts local people. Uh, you know, that's not on. The, the same with the, her support for, we've already talked about council tax, when that, that's hurting local people. The SNP government is trying to help small people, ordinary people in the East End, like small businesses, for example, abolishing the business rates over the next few years. By the Tories uh, I mean, forward. that's a huge step forward. And uh, clearly, we will work with any party in the Scottish government that is for the benefit of the Scottish people. But what about the idea of a windfall tax? I'm, I'm certainly open to these kind of things. And I think that the, the main point I would make on that is, do we want another Labour MP going down to Westminster and just being part of the establishment? Oh, or do we else. want somebody who's going to go down there and challenge them? Because if we send a Labour MP down again, Gordon Brown is just going to carry on like he has been. Uh, if we send an, an SNP MP down there, people are going to wake up. No, I think no, 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 it's, it's time for a, as as uh, the SNP says, it's time for, well, yes. it time for a time bigger for a slice of money to come to Scotland. Well, this is one issue that we could discuss. We've discussed many issues. John's made a good point here. Why do we send a Labour MP? No, no, no. That's oh, no. no, 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 no John, we well raised that point, point, but that's well, not the question well, I've asked you. Well, yes, should, we, should, Scotland, the, should Scotland have a, high, a bigger slice of the of the economic cake? Well, there's a report come out quite recently saying that Scotland actually getting too much money, and we have to look into which report is correct. Now, there are many, and it's like all the debates we've had. There are evidence suggesting one thing and another. It's an issue which has to be looked at. So, if the report that says 
was getting too much is correct, then you would advocate what? Well, I think we have to look at the reports. What I'm saying here, Gary, is that what I'm saying here, Gary, is that there are conflicting reports, and it's a very detailed issue. What is not what's important to people on the doorstep is what we should be talking about in this debate. Now, John's made a very good point. Why are we sending down a Labour MP who will be part time, as she's clearly admitted in her own can campaign, that, Gary, in one minute, second, Margaret, minute. who's going to be part time, and he says that he can do a better job as an SNP MP. I would argue quite clearly that as a very, very single issue politician, focus party on independence, that will not be John's priority if he's elected as the MP. And quite simply, what we need in this constituency, and I don't need a lecture on these, Dinder, Margaret, because I've come from the constituency, is somebody who's local, somebody who knows the issues, and is is unperturbed by such issues as independence. So and back to the issue, the but back to the issue that. that I asked you to address, which is uh, about, about the, the, the amount of money yes. that Scotland gets. Yes. And you're advocating a review of the Barnett formula. Ultimately, that's, well, we, we believe that's, that. that's to lead to a reduction in the money that Scotland gets no, from no, central no, government. No, not it? at all. We believe that the Scottish Parliament should be given more powers. We believe that there's a greater deal of fiscal autonomy needed, and I think that would raise money for the Scottish Parliament. It gives them more autonomy. It allows us to have a better dialogue with Westminster. And ultimately, we're making things happen for the Scottish people. We're not arguing with Westminster, and we're not doing nothing about the problem. OK, let's so. move on to something else. Davina Rankin, should a politician ever have two jobs? I would leave that to <laughs> Alex Salmond and Margaret Curran to defend, <laughs> but if I was elected as an MP, I'd be a full-time MP at Westminster, joining my colleagues in the benches who are likely to form the next government. So a politician we, should never have two jobs? A politician should put the people, their constituents first, Absolutely. focus on the issues that matter to them, i.e. cost of living, um, crime, um, rising cost of fuel and do that on a full-time basis. And, and that would apply, obviously, to those MPs already who have directorships, etc., and, and work for private companies. I think the main focus should always be the constituents, as I've already said. Um, as I said, as I started, it's down to Margaret to defend her choice to maintain her role as an MSP as an MP. I think it's down to Alex Salmond to defend his choice of maintaining a role as an MP, an MSP, and leader of a, a minority administration. They can speak for themselves. I'm more focused on what the people of Glasgow East want, and they want someone who will work full time, work hard for them, and stand up and speak on their behalf. Ian Robertson, should a politician ever have two jobs? Absolutely not. I mean, I'll be very clear about this. I think if you want to be the MP for your constituency, I think you know you need to know the constituency, you need to be local, you need to be dedicated, you need to have your one single focus should be helping people. It shouldn't be independence, it shouldn't be helping your buddies in Westminster, it should be about the people of the constituency. No single job is more important than that, and that's why I would dedicate myself to that if I was elected as the so MP. So the same should apply to Mingus Campbell, QC MP? Well, I think that that's a matter for Mingus Campbell in terms of his own practice. I've made my decision. But he's wrong, it. but isn't he, given what you've just said? Uh, given my opinion, I think that Mingus Campbell should consider that in his own way. But what I'm saying is that as the Glasgow East by-election candidate, that's my commitment to the constituency. Mingus Campbell represents another constituency, can make his own decision on that, Gary. You're asking me a very direct question. I'm giving you a 100% answer, which is more than my colleagues, certainly the two in the middle well, of this we'll debate. Can I, can I, can 100% we'll MP for the East End of Glasgow, that will be my sole purpose. So, can I, can I first just, well, let's just address this question. Should an, a, a, an MP ever have, or a politician ever have two jobs? Well, I think the answer to that is, what does the electorate want? And the electorate in the north of Scotland clearly decided that they did want Alex Salmon because they think of him so highly. And I'm asking a question, I'm not saying what the electorate should decide, but I'm just saying to the electorate in the East End of Glasgow, would you rather have an MSP and an MP, two voices for the East End, or would you just rather have one voice? So you clearly think it's wrong for a politician to have two jobs? I think, given the challenges of the East End, it would be better to have two voices for the East End. So it's wrong. I just wanted to double check you with you. Position. It's wrong to have two jobs. That's what we I said last week. I said, I want the electorate just to consider, um, is it better to have one voice or is it better to have two voices? And I would have thought in most cases, when you take a, sub, a, a player off you a football team, you normally take it back up to 11. So I'm just suggesting to the East End, or the people of the East End of Glasgow, wouldn't it be better to have two voices? But can you see why one? some people might see a, a huge helping of hypocrisy in your position, given Alex Salmon's situation? Well, I don't. Th people who know me don't generally call me hip hypocritical. And what I'm, I'm just trying to emphasise is that it's really up to the electorate to decide. If the electorate want one person doing ten jobs, well, that's up to the electorate. That's happened before. But the electorate of the north of Scotland clearly wanted Alex Salmond eh, because they, they respected him so much. And I would just suggest that maybe the East End has got so many challenges that we need a full-time MSP and a full-time MP. Margaret Curran, in a constituency where a lot of people don't have one job, how do you yeah. defend having two? Well, I can't pretend, Gary, that this is a career move that I had planned for some time and I was trying to dupe the electorate in some way. Well, just resign from Hollywood. Well, I, well what I wanted to do was... Um, I'll uh, fight the by-election. Um, uh, I, I wanted to... <laughs> excuse me, if I could have a shot here. Um, I, I mean, in some ways, I agree with Councillor Mason because what I'm saying is I'm putting myself to the electorate and saying this is the kind of 
um, plan I have for the short term. I would be honest and say I don't think it's sustainable in the long term. But I, my, well, what is the long term? We're talking three years potentially. Well, you have two but jobs. But I, my entire the constituency I've got at the moment is entirely within the New Glasgow East seat that I would be fight, that I'm fighting for on the 24th of July. Yes, indeed. I know but you the, can't be in two places know, at once because you'd be expected people, to be at Westminster and Holyrood. Uh, but sometimes the timetables shift. That, that and I, could, I, I intend to be active in both parliaments in so the short three, term. So three you, years you would be can, but, you would have this dual mandate. Can I tell you? I mean, I, I do accept there'd be some shift in my responsibilities at the moment. For example, I'm a member of the Shadow Cabinet, and I give enormous amount of commitment to that and work very hard at that. But I do think, and I'm not, I could never be as vain as Alex Salmond. But I do think I've got a track record in the East End. I do. I would be a full-time advocate for the East End. Well, why I don't think just I, tell people how can, long you would hold this dual mandate because for? Three years. Because, yeah, yeah. Three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because what I would want to do is, if elected, and again, I would have to make it clear, I take absolutely nothing for granted, and I'm out there to work very hard. I, I, the vibes are good, and I'm heading in the right direction, but I'm taking nothing for granted. I would discuss that with the local community. I would discuss that with the local party, and I wouldn't spring anything on anyone. But well, I, I'm honestly, then. with the greatest respect to everyone and put myself forward honestly and that's the criteria. As people have said, it's been done before. It is not without precedent and I honestly, I would not do it if I didn't think I could I could deliver it and believe me, John, that's my John Mason, is your willingness to fight a by-election in Bailiston if Margaret Trump stands down a concession of defeat? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, thank you. You've got before uh, me. No, I don't think so. We're, uh, I I, we're fighting this to win and uh, I'm not satisfied coming second. Uh, I want to win this and we believe we can. It's, it's a very unusual set of situation in the East End at the moment. We've got a popular SNP government in, in Holyrood. We've got a very unpopular mm -hmm. uh, government down in Westminster. And with the things like the high fuel prices, the high gas, the high electricity, uh, this is a chance not to change the government, but to send a message to the government that I'll they've got that to wake up. They've got to wake up. And it needs a voice that will speak out, not part of the establishment. OK, I just want to move on to a couple of uh, uh, other issues before we finish. Uh, Britain's most senior military officers confirmed to the BBC today that troops will remain in Iraq next year. Of course, we were told in April that there'd be a reduction and then all of that has changed. Um, Ian Robertson, ultimately, it looks as though we're not winning in Iraq, we're not winning in Afghanistan. Yes, I mean, you, you mentioned Sir Mingus Campbell earlier on in the programme, and he's been a, a great spokesman for our party on this issue. We've advocated for a long time that, that, that the war was obviously a mistake, and I think that's the consensus opinion at the moment. What we have to do is withdraw our troops. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not very happy to hear that that's not going to happen as soon as it possibly could. But well, that's we have to the do situation's this. unstable, we have to so do you this. would just pull them out right now? No, no, now. no, no. We've never said that. We've always said that we support what the troops are doing, and we're very much behind our troops in, in that part of the world. What we're saying is we do that in a phased way, but we don't delay the decision, we don't delay discussing it, and we don't delay thinking about it. So I'm very uh, upset to hear that we're not making progress on this issue because I think it's to the benefit of the people of Iraq. It's certainly to the benefit of the troops that are out there and their families at home. But we must discuss this issue. We can't shelve this and we can't ignore it. So we've always been saying that something has to be done. And Davina Bank, the Tories have been shoulder to shoulder, as it were, with Labour on this particular issue. It looks as though things aren't moving as fast in Iraq as was previously thought. We know that there have been real problems in Afghanistan. The number of deaths of military personnel has uh, risen dramatically in recent weeks. So there's a real sense that on both fronts, things just aren't working? Things are not going as well as people would have hoped to. I think the first thing I'd like to do is to emphasise in support for the troops. I mean, we fully support and um, send messages of support to them in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and I think that's important to emphasise. We would like to see a very much managed withdrawal from Iraq as soon as possible, but... but the, what but does that mean? As you when said, is as soon as possible? Well, when the situation's stable, you said it yourself, that the situation is not stable, which is Five why... Five years, ten years? I can't predict what the situation on the ground will be. I'd leave that to our senior military advisers, plus the Iraqi government to advise us when it would be safe to withdraw, because we don't want to leave the Iraqis in a dangerous situation. And likewise, in Afghanistan, a lot of effort is going into rebuilding the schools that the Taliban destroyed to allow school children, school girls, mm -hmm. to be educated. Yeah, and these are important policies mm -hmm. that have to be put, put in place. But at the same time, we do need to have a scheduled, managed face withdrawal that will not expose the Iraqis or those living in Afghanistan to more danger. We're in there now. We'd like to see a full review of why we went into this situation in the first place, find out why decisions were made, find out why things are not progressing as fast as possible. But we need a face managed withdrawal. And it well, can't because you supported the war and uh, you did so publicly in the, in the parliament. It's, it looks on the face of it as though the Iraq adventure is, uh, is, is really going badly wrong now. Well, I 
couldn't do anything other than deny that I'm deeply troubled by the situation in Iraq. I did at the time, I would have to say, I was persuaded of the evidence that in was hindsight, being... that was wrong. Yeah. Well, with hindsight, it has taught us a great deal, and I wouldn't try and pretend. You know, it's easy for me to sit here now and say and condemn everybody who made the decision at, the, at that time, but we all know the, the, what the intelligence reports were telling us. But there is no doubt the situation is very different from what I certainly anticipated it to be. And I don't think if you're human, you can watch the TV at night and see the images and not be moved by them. I think it, you know, it is certainly very difficult. I mean, I would absolutely endorse what people have said about the troops. You know, the troops from Scotland and from the United Kingdom are doing a superb job, and we must pay them enormous thanks and credit and respect for that. But nonetheless, there is no doubt there are difficulties. I do think Afghanistan is slightly different from mm -hmm. many of the points that Davina has made, you know, in terms of, you know, just the excesses of the Taliban and just what's happening there. But, you know, it's deeply troubling. I would yes, I mean, what we, we are being told from the military advisers is that because the situation is so volatile, all the more reason for British troops to stay there, John Mason. We shouldn't have been in Iraq in the first place. And I'm afraid this is one of the issues where we see Labour and the Tories and really no space between them to, to really notice that uh, they are part of this uh, mindset in London that we should be going around interfering uh, in other countries. Now, it's one thing if the United Nations approves it, as in Afghanistan. Uh, but well, we we're, we're there now, exactly. aren't we? Exactly. So well, we, we have to deal with the relative decision. We have to take it out. I mean, there have been various suggestions, and one is to replace the Western troops, because there's, there's clearly a lot of anti-Western feeling. But the idea of getting in, say, more Asian or African troops, which might be more acceptable as an interim basis, I think, is one that should be looked at. OK, just another issue that was in the newspapers uh, this morning, and it's uh, a report that says, Dina Rankin, that Margaret Thatcher, uh, who's very well at the moment, I should point out, but plans are being made to give her a state <coughs> funeral that would be the first one since Winston Churchill for uh, a former Prime Minister. Would that be a fitting tribute, briefly? Um, the fact that she's well and healthy, um, <laughs> I would uh, not anticipate. I think uh, funeral arrangements are best left to when they're needed. Um, I think it's you have to, to plan ahead, obviously, for something like this. You do have to plan ahead for something like this, but she's well and she'll probably be around for a lot longer. So I think it's premature to be planning her funeral at this stage. Oh, my God, Gordon well, Brown's planning this. Is that a fitting tribute to the Tory former Tory? Well, if the Tories won't even advocate it, and there's a bit distasteful perhaps to talk about funeral plans for someone who's still alive, um, Mrs Thatcher was not well thought of in the East End of Glasgow, so our funeral arrangements are a matter for other people, not for me, I can assure you. So you, you wouldn't back the idea of a state funeral? No, I wouldn't. Well, again, it's a bit distasteful talking about it, and I accept Davina's point, but uh, I remember Thatcher's legacy and I couldn't get over that, I don't think. Is it a fitting tribute, John Mason? Well, I think both Thatcher and Blair were not well thought of in the East End of Glasgow, so I don't think oh, either don't think of them. I don't think either of them should have a state funeral in the East End of Glasgow. Well, I don't imagine it'll be in the East End of Glasgow, <laughs> that's for sure. And what about you, Ian Robertson? <coughs> well, I think politics is a very difficult uh, job, Gary, and I think that you know, although she is deeply unpopular in the East End of Glasgow and won't get a lot of support in these parts, I think that she's contributed a great deal and served her country, and I think it's fitting that we recognise that and that she's given the state funeral. I don't have any problem with it, and I'm sure that many people will recognise what she did you know, for, for, for government. Just a final point then. You've all told us how in touch with the electorate you are. You've been out there meeting them. They're all telling you, of course, that food prices are going up. Nobody could fail to notice that. So uh, let's just check how in touch you are with oh, gosh. food prices. <laughs> uh, I've just got a quick question for each of you. Um, yeah, and I can see the dread on your faces. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Divina Rankin. What we did was we, we checked a couple of supermarkets. This is like an average price, so we'll let you be out slightly. Um, six eggs. We checked free-range eggs. How much would you pay for half a dozen eggs? Uh, it's about one pound. Forty one pound fifty, depending on your store. Oh, one pound thirty six. So right. that was fairly close. Uh, Margaret Curran, um, perhaps well known, eighty tea bags from a well known uh, company. How much would you pay for eighty tea bags? One pound seventy seven. Oh, People hey, how feel like that? Who does the shopping yeah. in your houses? Uh, let's go to you then, John Mason. What about uh, a white, a white loaf? And we, you can give us the price for the own brand or perhaps for one of the well-known brands, so either or. Yeah, well, there's quite a range, and uh, I mean, I'd probably pay around a pound because you do get a better quality if you pay a little bit more. But for a lot of people, it's got to be cheaper than that. Well, we're sold sixty nine pence for yes. the own brand and, and one pound twenty one for the other one. And just finally to you then, Ian Robertson, uh, four pints of milk. The one that most people buy in their weekly shop. Oh, no, I never, buy, I, I never buy four pints <laughs> of milk. Two, two I, can't, I can't afford four pints of cartons. I would say four pints of milk, I would say that's going to be in the region of £2.20. No, unfortunately, you take the booby prize on this one. Oh £1.44 oh for four okay. pints of milk. So I never quite, buy four pints. Not quite as, as expensive <laughs> as you thought. Well, look, let me thank you all very much indeed for thank joining you. us on the programme this afternoon. So we've heard from the four main parties, but what are the, they're not the only ones, of course, uh, who want to give a voice to the people of Glasgow East. Our reporter, Katrina Renton, has been out and about to see what the smaller parties are up to. If you live in Glasgow East, you might be confused by all the attention. This by-election is being watched by far more than the people who actually have a vote. 
Some believe the result here will determine the Prime Minister's future. But what's being reported about the place itself is pretty depressing. This is the constituency where, in some parts, life expectancy is just 63 for a man, 14 years less than the UK average. 50% of adults have no qualifications at all, and it has the second highest unemployment rate in Scotland. Some would argue the larger parties have had a chance to make inroads over the years, but seem to have failed. I am your local green candidate. Retired GP Dr Eileen Duke is the Greens candidate. She's currently the party's co-convener for Glasgow and the west of Scotland. We think everything's going in the wrong direction at the moment. The other parties are not dealing with climate change and climate change is what is causing a lot of the problems around here. Um, the, the, the fuel poverty, the um, poor public transport, um, there's the petrol prices are going up and everybody's concentrating on cars whereas most people in this area use public transport and they would they would like good affordable public transport instead of money being thrown away all eyes are on the big parties in this election but there are nine candidates standing and the smaller parties say that their message is just as important to the people in glasgow east now there are two socialist parties contesting this election opinion is split about whether there's room for them both all agree the area needs a champion. Tricia McLeish is a technical officer at Glasgow City Council. She lives in the constituency and is a founding member of Solidarity. Solidarity are for a minimum wage of 8.50 an hour. We are also for a minimum pension of £200 a week. We also stand for public ownership of the big corporations such as gas, electricity and the oil industry. People have struggled too long with rising fuel bills and food costs. We are saying we need a change and that's why we're asking people to vote for solidarity. Much of this constituency is dogged with entrenched poverty and generations of worklessness. But this isn't news. In the, by the Scottish Socialist Party's Frances Curran is a former member of the Scottish Parliament. She grew up in this constituency and has campaigned in the area for over 30 years. I want to put it on the agenda and challenge every other politician about deprivation and poverty. Tackling it is not that difficult. We've never been as rich as we are now, but who's got the wealth? We need to redistribute it and we would introduce policies that would redistribute wealth. Introduce an £8 an hour minimum wage and you've tackled it. Increase child benefit and you've tackled it. Increase pensions and you've tackled it. And the point is the wealth is there. Don't let anybody kid you on. So would a vote for any of these smaller parties actually make any difference? People should vote Green uh, because we are the only ones that have the answer to the main problem in the world today, the main threat to the human species which is global warming. Six billion was wasted in an illegal war in Iraq. A hundred billion is going towards the replacement of Trident weapons. We say, use that 106 billion more productively, put it into tackling poverty and inequality. If people want to make a protest, then voting Scottish Socialist Party is the way to do it. Because it would send a signal both to Westminster and to the Scottish Parliament and the SNP that no more, we're not accepting it, we're going to rise up, we're going to elect a fighter. If you live in Glasgow East, you can expect more of this for the next 11 days. And it's up to voters to decide who they think can give this place the boost it needs. Katrina Rent in there with the Greens, the Scottish Socialists and Solidarity. In total, there are nine candidates standing in the Glasgow East by-election on Thursday, July the 24th. There they are in the order that they will appear on the ballot paper.